Um, so thanks everyone for joining us here today. We're going to be talking about ethical and inclusive small scale fisheries communications. Uh, we've got a great lineup of panelists here today with us. So Mohammed Arju from the ICCA Consortium in Bangladesh. We've got Dr. Anouk Ride from World Fish and she's based in the Solomon Islands. And we have Dr. Prateep Kumar Nayak of the University of Waterloo uh, in Canada. And he's also involved in the Vulnerability to Viability Global Partnership. And the panellists today will really be digging in and reflecting on some questions about ethical and inclusive small scale fisheries communications. This webinar supports the recent launch of a guide, which you're seeing on the screen. Um, and that guide's really intended to be a free resource for all of us um, working in small scale fisheries, particularly those uh, holding a communications role in working in the global space, aiming to influence and inform policy and decisions. So there's just some tips and practical advice um, on how we can communicate some of the correct messages and narratives, good practices and positive examples for all of us to really reflect on to ensure that our communications are really supporting and getting behind the needs and concerns and solutions of small scale fisheries, making sure they're really at the heart of our communications. So we're going to run through a series of panel questions today. Um, and, and once we get to the end of those, we will invite participants to share any questions they have, uh, just pop them in the chat anytime during the call and we will get to those at the end. Um, but please feel free to have any, jot down any thoughts and comments. We want this to be an interacting, interactive, engaging conversation. And like I said, we did have 50 people register. We've only got a, a small number right now with us, but we will be share, I will be sharing this recording with everyone that did register. So um, that's absolutely fine. So what we'll do, we'll get kick started. Um, so just to open up the panel discussion, I'm interested to hear from our panelists about why are ethical and inclusive small scale fisheries important, communications important, and what's at risk if we fail at this? So we'll get uh, Anouk maybe to start first. Thanks Kate and thanks everyone for joining this session. Um, I think since uh, it's the first time for me to speak, I'll just explain uh, my role here. So I'm a social scientist with uh, World Fish in Solomon Islands. And a big part of my work is actually, and previous to sort of uh, working as a researcher, I also worked in communications for many years. <laughs> um, so now I can sort of combine both hats, particularly when it comes to communications with rural communities and fisheries communities, um, and also supporting the government to um, have good communications with uh, the communities and the stakeholders that they have. So in relation to your question, why is communications important? I really think that it's true what they say that information is power. Um, and this is never more true than when you're working with uh, communities. So communities that have uh, information that they need, the knowledge they need to manage their fisheries. Um, most communities in the Pacific, they have rights to their coastal fisheries areas and they manage those areas themselves. Um, but having the right information to actually be able to manage um, that, uh, those fisheries well is really important. And also to be able to develop their fisheries. So to gain you know, sustainable and adequate livelihoods from um, their fisheries. So I think that for me is, the, is one of the big focuses of my work. Um, but of course, communications about small scale fisheries is also really important for policymakers. Um, and I often feel that national policymakers are really focused on um, offshore fisheries. You know, those are the fisheries that make them money, particularly in the Pacific. So in the Pacific, uh, tuna fish is one of the major sources of revenue for national governments. So naturally their focus will be there um, in some respects, um, but we also need to make sure that they remember that the um, coastal fisheries is what's providing the food security for the vast majority of Pacific Islanders. And so even though it's not necessarily crossing the desks of national policymakers all the time, um, it is actually really important for nutrition, um, livelihoods, um, health and um, indigenous rights. 
Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll go, I'll uh, end there for an introduction. Thanks, Kate. Thank you very much, uh, Kate, for the invitation and the wonderful opportunity to you know, engage in discussions around you know, inclusivity and, uh, you know, um, and ethical considerations in communication. Um, as Kate already mentioned, you know, I'm at the University of Waterloo. I'm an associate professor here, but the other hat that I wear is pretty relevant to uh, the discussions today. I'm also the associate dean for equity, diversity, inclusion, and justice. And so it's my everyday work uh, here to look at these uh, considerations in uh, in actions and uh, and the work of uh, uh, us uh, in the in the faculty here. But I also represent uh, the. Uh, so, you know, uh, B2B or vulnerability to viability global partnership on building strong small scale uh, fisheries around the world, especially focusing on Africa and Asia. Um, and, uh, you know, if you look at, you know, how do you build strong small scale fisheries, communication is a critical is a critical element of how you can build strong and viable small scale uh, fisheries. Uh, the moment we stop, uh, you know, uh, uh, engaging in communications around SSF, the S, uh, SSF sector or SSF systems, start to become invisible more and more. And so, and to in increase the visibility, increase uh, the level of recognition that uh, these communities uh, in remote corners of the world sometimes uh, are doing wonderful work and uh, you know thriving and surviving based on their actions in the small scale fisheries domain uh, remains visible so it is important very very important but at the same time just communication is not important uh, you know or significant unless it is linked to uh, you know ethical and uh, and inclusive uh, you know principles you know uh, the moment we uh, you know no one wants to engage in unethical communication or, or or anything that is unethical so it is almost the ground rule it is the it is the best practice, it is the best principle and the values that, uh, you know, you know pushes us to engage in ethical and inclusive, uh, you know, communications. Otherwise, we ruin it all forever. We don't, you know, make any progress. So that's the, that's the, that's my uh, opening remark in terms of the importance of uh, communication, especially ethical and uh, inclusive communication pertaining to small scale fisheries. Thank you. Okay, Arju, over to you. Yeah, hello everyone. Morning from here. And thank you, Kate, for inviting me. And uh, my name is Muhammad Arju. I work for International Association, uh, Indigenous and Local Community Concept Area Consortium, ICC Consortium. And I also happen to be uh, from Bangladesh, a coastal uh, region where I, you know, uh, I was raised in a peeping community, and I also work locally in Bangladesh. Uh, to your question, I think um, when we are talking about uh, inclusivity and ethics in communications related to these issues, I am of course uh, no expert, but from my work experience in communications and with local organizations and fishers, I think uh, the spaces uh, where the fishing communities, people in fisheries overall, not just fishers, and uh, they live and they work. Uh, there are other organizations who are not stakeholders, uh, sorry, who are not right holders, but stakeholders. They have a stake uh, in these issues. Uh, they also communicate. Uh, we have uh, you know, very few challenges when it comes to communications by fishers associations or people in fisheries. But I think uh, when we, uh, stressed on the importance of ethics and inclusivity in communications related to community fisheries and artisanal fisheries. We are mostly uh, you know, talking about and concerned about communications by other stakeholder organizations, scientists, international NGOs, fisheries managers, CSOs, even organizations like us who are supporting uh, these communities, but not you know, uh, within or from these communities. And I think uh, ethics is important first and foremost uh, because ethics in communications you know, relate to uh, being accurate, uh, being truthful, uh, being responsible, and of course, uh, you know, being inclusive. And if we don't have uh, this kind of qualities, this kind of consider consideration when we prepare, when we uh, communicate, or prepare communication contents, then we don't have the trust of uh, you know, 
other stakeholders and right holders. And uh, if I think about it like uh, from uh, another uh, viewpoint uh, that will be when organization like us, uh, other stakeholders or even scientists or you know mass media, the journalists, when we communicate about issues uh, related to uh, artisanal fisheries and community fisheries, what we actually do, among other things, we mediate uh, between the fishing communities, between the people and fisheries, the fisheries managers, and among the stakeholders. And if even one of the parties, uh, you know, don't trust the communications that we do, then we are not, you know, uh, effective mediator anymore. So I think uh, to sum up, uh, ethics in communications related to these issues are important. Uh, for me, first and foremost, because you know it helps us uh, to be trustworthy. And if we are not uh, ethical, it shows uh, you know the parties can understand. And then we don't have the power as mediator to bring the change uh, we want to. Thank you. Thanks, all. That was a really good framing of, of the situation that we're all facing. Um, now I want to move over to some problematic small scale fisheries messages because it is quite a rich and diverse and nuanced sector and equally our messages and our narratives need to be accurate and nuanced. So maybe we could touch on some problematic small scale fisheries messages that need to be corrected. What's the right way of communicating about some of these issues? Anouk? Thanks, Kate. So um, it's interesting to hear the other speakers, um, Arju and, and Pratip, um, the issue of invisibility um, of the sector more broadly. Um, we can also see the invisibility of women within the sector is a common problem that we have in the Pacific. Um, so when we put out fisheries messages, for example, it's often, you know, pictures of men and boats and so forth, and that can often mask actually the women who are fishing. Um, an interesting sort of thing that happens to me quite regularly is that, you know, you can go to a community and ask like who does, you know, the fishing of the main sort of commercial species, and people will say men, but you will also at the same time in most of those communities find women doing those same fishing. And so the invisibility of women's fishing is a real issue for us in the Pacific. And it is sometimes perpetuated through communications that um, agencies do in and around the Pacific. Um, I think another problematic message that sort of can come out from time to time is, and it's a, it's a problem more broadly with the development sector, is the focus on innovation. So the focus on innovation is good and it's, it's interesting and you know sort of new, but actually the best innovation we have in the Pacific to deal with food security um, and livelihoods is um, community-based fisheries management. So management that coastal communities have been doing for, um, for decades. Yeah, so this is actually a traditional practice that is now built on with modern management techniques. Um, and it's not an innovation per se, but you know, why should we de-emphasize it because it's not in this sort of framework of what's new and interesting. Um, I think those are the two things I was going to outline. Yeah, I'll just jump in uh, there. You know, uh, I mean, some of the problematics uh, are uh, actually hidden in the way we address small scale fisheries. You know, sometimes we are uh, overtly engaged in discussing small scale fisheries in comparison to large scale fisheries, you know, and therefore we lose the unique characteristics that small scale fisheries uh, may have. Um, so, so that's it. That's a wrong messaging uh, sometimes, you know, because small scale fisheries, you know, being compared and their values and their understanding emanates from, uh, you know, our understanding of large scale fisheries, you know, that's not always correct, you know. But at the same time, you know, in many of the messagings that we see in communications, you know, uh, there is again a, a, a predominant focus on certain aspects of the fisheries. For example, you know, we are engaged in vulnerability and viability or resilience uh, work uh, around small scale fisheries. Um, a lot of uh, communications, even the scholarly literature included, uh, tend to focus uh, on vulnerabilities, you know, marginalization and uh, poverty and uh, other kinds of, you know, um, uh, processes of, you know, uh, 
uh, you know, uh, how uh, small scale fisheries is disadvantaged historically in systemic uh, ways uh, is uh, emphasized. They are not bad in, in terms of, you know, uh, having a story or having a picture or image of small scale fisheries being marginalized, uh, being vulnerable. But at the same time, we that doesn't lead to in the communications uh, to telling uh, the stories of the strength, uh, the stories of the prospects of viability within small scale fisheries. You know, you know the the, the typical you know uh, as in discussion that we have in our global network is if the small scale fisheries were only vulnerable for you know uh, you know generations and generations, they would have perished by now. The fact that they have you know kept going. Uh, you know, indicate certain strengths. You know, therefore, despite vulnerability, you know, they are continuing to uh, do, uh, you know, exist, and therefore, uh, the need to explore the strengths, and therefore, the need to explore the prospects for, you know, uh, this uh, uh, small-scale fisheries community is becoming viable, resilient, and sustainable. You know, so so that kind of a comprehensive and uh, uh, and 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 holistic kind of you know uh, communication is required because we can't just you know look at one side of the coin and then say, okay, these are vulnerable and not get to the other question of how they can become viable or is it only vulnerable or there are strengths and all. So that's that, that kind of messaging is required in communication. Um, I think the other is, is also related and I'll give you my experience uh, just uh, you know, I know a month back, I was at a conference and uh, I was presenting about vulnerability viability global network and, and uh, uh, a very senior scholar caught me and then he said, so because my statement was, uh, you know, small scale fisheries, despite being vulnerable, uh, uh, do make significant contributions to, you know, the local and regional and, uh, and uh, national economies and, uh, you know, food security and, uh, and uh, I was, uh, you know, I, uh, this, uh, you know, uh, person and then, you know, said, okay, yeah, I mean, that's the wrong messaging because he, it almost sounds like, you know, because they contribute to these economies, they contribute to the society, therefore we need to recognize them. Of course, I didn't mean that by, you know, you know uh, but, you know, it was an interesting, you know, uh, take by uh, one listener who thinks that, you know, the way I communicated uh, meant that we need to recognize small scale fisheries because they're, you know, contributing members of the fisheries, uh, you know, uh, larger uh, society. Um, and then I'm kind of in thinking about, uh, you know, uh, how to uh, correct or how to change uh, the communication uh, from my end so that it doesn't uh, get interpreted uh, in, in the way it was. You know? So uh, in that sense, it could be very context specific. It could be very uh, specific to uh, you know, groups of people who could be ideologically driven, who could be uh, driven by their own uh, you know, experiences and expertise in certain areas of fisheries or small scale fisheries. You know? So how to make our messaging or communication uh, more uh, you know balanced i would say quote unquote and uh, uh, and and holistic in the sense that it could be received by multiple you know listeners or actors or stakeholders uh, is a challenge and uh, therefore a problem sometimes if we don't do it well thank you yeah thanks i, I think uh, you know uh, this question about balancing between vulnerabilities and if i may strength or the potential of resilience. It's a big thing and many of the problematic past messages. Uh, first of all, there are so many problematic messages, at least I see uh, about artisanal fisheries and community fisheries. You know, It's difficult to single out one or two, but as we're talking about it, uh, for example, right now where I am, uh, uh, there is a big fishing community. This is a place called Coxsuff Bazaar. And in Bangladesh, and we have a fishing ban going on. And rightly, I see uh, there are many CSO, civil society organizations, and NGOs, and even mainstream media. Uh, they're focusing on uh, how vulnerable uh, the fishing communities are uh, in Bangladesh during such a fishing ban season, uh, because people are actually starving uh, uh, families. And I am seeing. Uh, uh, reports after reports in TV, national televisions, local channels, uh, newspapers, and so on. And uh, personally, you know, I, I I can't complain about it because this is something uh, personally I and some of the civil society leaders here in Bangladesh we try to sensitize the journalists about that these are the issues that need to be covered. But again, uh, 
all we see is how vulnerable these communities are, how they're starving, how their families are suffering during a fishing ban season. But again, because uh, the communicators are not considering that these people have a right to these sp uh, spaces and these people have the potential, you know, to overcome these challenges. They are just focusing on whether the government is giving them food rations or not. Other potentials that these communities, particularly one of the island here called Moheshkali, just a decade ago, they have a strong local governance systems for fisheries, and there are no complaints from the traditional uh, community fishery, uh, people in the fisheries here about this kind of situation. But when, you know, there are more institutionalization and top-down fisheries management, then they lost it to other competitors. That means uh, there was a time and still they think with their, what uh, Anuk was saying that the right of the communities in the Pacific to manage their coastal uh, fishing grounds or fishing areas are recognized. But in countries like Bangladesh, it's not. And this is uh, you know, one of the causes of this kind of vulnerability. But none of these issues are being discussed. Uh, most of the media and advocacy communications material by NGOs are focusing on how vulnerable these communities are. These are important. I personally want this, but you know, again, uh, this is not leading or helping us to, you know, a way out from this. And I think one of the responsibility of ethical communication is also to do that. Yeah, yeah. Thank Can you. I just quickly add one point to, you know, uh, uh, what Aju was saying? Uh, I mean, the, one of the problem areas is that these communications are not often by the fishers themselves. You know, so somebody else is doing it for them. And that's where the pro problem emerges, actually, and then it persists and continues. Um, and and the other factor is, you know, we always talk about, you know, the dominant narratives in certain uh, fields. You know, what are the dominant narratives that are being, you know, uh, uh, used in in communicating stuff about uh, small scale fisheries? And these narratives are controlled and created and. Uh, perpetuated by, uh, you know, people that are not small scale fishers, you know, most of the time. Um, so we're seeing absence of, you know, communication uh, or lack of communication uh, from the small scale fisheries community is therefore, you know, somebody else is, you know, uh, controlling these narratives about the small scale fisheries. And that's a big problem area, actually. Okay, thank you all. We do have lots of questions to get through, so we'll keep moving on. <laughs> um, okay, so how can collaboration enhance small scale fisheries communications? That goes to Pratik's point just then that, you know, we should be, it should be the fishers and the community speaking um, in collaboration with other stakeholders, but often that, that relationship is not quite right. So how do we really build that? collaboration to achieve better communications. Anouk? Yeah, I think um, at Worldfish we've used lots of participatory approaches and so that helps us to understand um, how to do things in a way that comes from the community's perspective rather than someone else's perspective, which relates to um, what Pratip was saying. I think the problem with communications in the small scale fisheries sector is that often it's driven by agencies that have one agenda, like I'm a conservation organization, so I'll look at it that way. I'm a women's rights organization, I'll look at it that way. I am a, um, you know, I'm focused on livelihood, so we'll look at it that way. Um, and so that means that both communities and governments kind of get these different lenses over the problem that really, if you talk to community members, they usually see it in a more um, holistic way. Um, so it's about the frames that we use. and actually collaborating so that, um, you know, we're, we're bringing together these different frames into a more holistic framework. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, it, it's, it's a direct connection with the uh, term uh, inclusivity or inclusion. You know, if you want inclusive uh, small scale uh, fisheries, we want inclusive communication and to have inclusive communication, we need collaboration. You know, without collaboration, we cannot have inclusive. You know. um, when I think of, you know, collaboration immediately, I am kind of, you know, uh, my, 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 my brain goes to 
the diversities uh, within the small scale fisheries and uh, how small scale fisheries is not only you know diverse but multi-dimensional and uh, complex and uh, there are too many threads to uh, count on or to connect uh, within small scale fishery and some of them are deep rooted some of them are you know really historical uh, and and messy uh, if we want to engage in there uh, no one group or no one individual or no, no one you know uh, uh, institution is going to be enough, you know, or you know, for that matter, communities themselves may not be enough to, uh, you know, respond to these challenges and the diversities and all. So, uh, so collaboration becomes, you know, very apparent, you know, collaboration becomes almost uh, impossible to avoid. Uh, uh, in that kind of you know uh, context, uh, so therefore uh, we need collaboration to make uh, small scale fisheries uh, you know viable, small scale fisheries more uh, you know active, living, engaging in responding to the day to day challenges that they that they face. Um, it also represents. Uh, you know, collaborations uh, represents the diversity of uh, of small scale fisheries, and therefore, when we collaborate, we not only bring in multiple perspectives to the uh, to 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 respond to the challenges, issues, and opportunities, but also you know we make sure that each of the problem areas, each of the opportunity areas within small scale fisheries, which I call diversity. Uh, are addressed, you know. Otherwise, you know, it is, you know, maybe some some issues, some opportunities, some challenges are, uh, you know, focused on others are, uh, you know, ignored. So to bring that holistic perspective, collaboration is important. But collaboration is also important given the politics, given the power dynamics that exist amongst the stakeholders. You know, so collaboration ensures that no one partner, no one actor dominates the field and takes over the scene. So that that's that's really really important uh, to to have uh, you know uh, to counter the you know negative uh, power dynamics and uh, and uh, other kinds of you know politics that happens uh, or potentially could happen. So it works really well, and we cannot avoid uh, collaboration within the small scale fisheries space. Yeah, I I think you know I remember some of the points that. Thero and Vivian was making yesterday uh, during the status webinar. And particularly Thero was repeatedly saying, uh, talking about uh, unknowns and the unexpected in artisanal fisheries and community fisheries. Uh, quite actually, he was focusing on it that it's very important that when we communicate about artisanal fisheries, community fisheries, uh, we acknowledge that there are so many unknowns, surprises, unexpected, that for other stakeholders uh, who are interested in doing communications about these issues, uh, you know, they are not just simply aware. So when I see, you know, problematic communications uh, from NGOs, CSOs, conservation groups, fisheries managers, or even, uh, you know, well-intentioned groups who have a stake in these uh, issues, I'm sure that you know they are not doing it because they wanted uh, to do it this way. It's just because you know they don't have the information. And also, even if uh, what Anuk was saying that uh, it is a problem that or a challenge at least that many of the communicators in uh, community fisheries, additional fisheries uh, have a single priority or issues. Personally, I am okay with even that. Like if you are a conservation organization and you want to uh, conserve some charismatic megafauna, or if you are like a aquaculture uh, group and you want to prioritize aquaculture, intensive industrial aquaculture within these spaces rather than you know, striking a balance, I'm okay with that. You know? Everyone, uh, every organization has their objectives, they have to pursue it, but being ethical, is a must. Like wh whatever you communicate, you need to be accurate. And being accurate about small scale fisheries, community fisheries is difficult because you don't have the information. You don't know about the surprises, unexpected and unknown issue. And of course, uh, to be accurate, you know, you need to let the fishers set the priorities of communications. First of all, that what they want to communicate about. For example, if I look into the, you know, right now, if I go out of my place, 
I will see a number of banners, festoons, billboards about the fishing ban season, which is going on here. All uh, done by international NGOs, local NGOs, fisheries managers. And I didn't find a single fisher who believe any of the messages. The best reaction from the fishers are they ignore it. I'm not, you know, talking about the host of the reactions because all the messages are talking about if the fisher don't comply with the ban season, there will be endless prosperities for them. <laughs> this is the only method uh, you see. And it's been two decades of this kind of uh, fisheries management in Bangladesh. Fisher didn't see any prosperity. And I, I'm uh, ending with this. Uh, if these organizations with all intention, if they went to a fishing group, if they work with a you know, union of fishers or fisheries organization, and to set the communications priority rather than you know just lending a hand to the fisheries manager and amplify their messages if they went to the fishing communities they you know would have different messages if they did that kind of collaboration and it, it's true for the scientists it's true for the researchers and like uh, true for organization like us without collaboration we can't get our messages right mm. yes so true <laughs> You've all, you've all repeated the same very important point. Okay, so um, what about how can we enhance representation of small scale fisheries in communication? So maybe we've already touched on it a little bit there, but we know particularly in global spaces, in the high level conferences and um, decision-making spaces, small scale fisheries often aren't there or they're really underrepresented, um, like at the UN Oceans Conference. Um, so how can we enhance representation um, in those sort of spaces where fisher folk just really aren't, don't have a voice and don't have a presence? Anouk? Um, I think it starts with your partnerships um, at the national level or the local level, yeah? To what extent um, are small scale fishers actually involved in decision making at the national level? Um, and so that often is, uh, you know, sharing tools and processes and different mechanisms that will actually um, give a voice to small scale fishers um, in decision making. Um, I think it's hard to model anything at the international level if you don't have it at the local and national level. So that's usually our focus um, here. Um, yeah, and I think within the representation too, again, we should look for um, the situation of women, uh, situation of, women, of people with disabilities and sort of broaden the representation of fishes uh, to be um, beyond just uh, the usual. So those would be my two things. Uh, a couple of thoughts about uh, this particular question. You know, one is to uh, on a flip the question uh, you know, uh, upside down and to think, I mean, uh, we're thinking of representation of small scale uh, you know, fisheries uh, in the existing communication platforms, you know, like you mentioned about you know, the global platforms and the regional platforms and all. Uh, what would it look like uh, to have representation of all these global uh, you know, actors and others in a community-led uh, communication process, you know, so uh, it would be very dif uh, different, you know, from what we are thinking. So representation is not just one way, but it could be the other way, you know. So strong community platforms for communication can uh, then seek representation of uh, people like us who are interested and uh, you know and want to contribute uh, to the uh, to the sustainability of and viability of small-scale fisheries, you know. So so I would like to see that way also. And uh, I'm not, and by that, I'm not saying the other way is the wrong way, but I also want to see the other way. Now, the you know, things starting from the community end. But uh, I think, you know, um, uh, how do we enhance small scale fisheries representation in communication uh, goes to the root factor uh, that, you know, we need to engage more and more into participatory, collaborative, interactive, and iterative, uh, you know, engagements, you know, so that would help then not only small scale fisheries representation, but representation of all uh, you know, key stakeholders in the press communication process itself, you know. But also if we are interested in, uh, you know, um, um, in, in the participation or representation of small scale fisheries uh, 
in the communication uh, processes, then we have to then start accepting some of the forms, formats, language, methods uh, that small scale fisheries uh, communities use in their day to day, you know, uh, engagements in the fisheries itself. Uh, we need to look at not only the dominant ways of you know doing communication, which could be verbal or written or something. We uh, should also focus on things like non-verbal communication. We need to, you know, uh, create uh, more, uh, you know, qualitative narratives, uh, stories, and those kind of you know, things that are more, uh, you know, uh, you know, that creates possibility of small-scale fisheries uh, uh, identifying themselves and their, uh, you know, realities uh, with those uh, things. You know, so there is a there is a whole lot of things that needs to be uh, done. But if you know, from the perspective of academia and research. You know, I also think that there is a need to uh, reflect on the on the research methods itself. You know, how do we do more qualitative research, which can be, uh, you know, a more accom accommodative in, in in the way, uh, you know, small scale fisheries uh, can, uh, you know, find representation or, you know, find uh, a way into the existing communication uh, systems. You know, so so there are, there are these different things that I'm thinking when I uh, was asked this question. Thank you. Um, I think uh, one of the, if I focus very narrowly about representation uh, in international forum that you asked, Kate, I think I, I will first, I will share some videos uh, from the feature, uh, mostly in uh, Mesoamerica, that the reactions, the feedback uh, they had uh, about how inclusive or participatory, for example, the last UN Ocean Conference was. And I think, uh, you know, we have experiences. Uh, for example, uh, to my observation, I think many of the FAO processes are more inclusive, more participatory than the other uh, processes. For example, uh, you know, the organizations that represent fishers, fishers organization and other organizations in fisheries are well represented in some of the FAO at least consultative, consultative processes than we saw during the last uh, two ocean conferences. And the difference uh, is because we think and the fisher thoughts, I interviewed um, uh, eight or nine features in detail I spent days uh, with them during the conference is that the UN processes, for example, are not, the agendas are not set by people or organizations that even work with fishing communities. You know, uh, it uh, sounds like very obvious or, you know, a very uh, must have thing uh, to have for this kind of forums, but you know, it's not. So I think uh, uh, very briefly, I would say this kind of processes, again, it's very obvious. It should have like this, you know, like bottom up and or include on national level and local level, the opinions of fishers then setting up the agendas. Even it matters, you know, how these forums for consultation or even decision making will be designed. Uh, I remember there is no translation, interpretation in any of the formal proceedings or meetings of UN Ocean Conference. Uh, but you know, there were fishers who doesn't speak uh, English, and I saw. Uh, uh, sessions about small scale fisheries without zero representative of, uh, representative of people in fisheries. So, you know, these are very obvious things that what the organizations need to do. But I think uh, I, I'm saying that other forums, other organizations, other processes should at least follow or learn from the APO processes that include people in fisheries. Great, thanks. Yeah, we had a previous webinar that looked uh, specifically at the UN Oceans Conference and we kind of spoke a bit about, you know, what, what was good, what was not so good and what really needs to be done better. And interpretation was a huge thing that came out just in terms of having equal access to the information. So that's a good point. I'm going to actually collapse the next two questions 
bring them together, seeing that we've only got 15 minutes left. Just a reminder to anyone, if you do have questions, just pop them in the chat. Um, if there's no questions, we'll keep running through our list because, um, you know, we could talk on this for hours. Um, so the next question for the panel is about language and how maybe some specific points on how we can improve our language when talking about small scale fisheries, um, but also reflecting on how can we make sure that our communications reflect the diversity um, of of the full richness and of, of small scale fisheries and, and are truly in, inclusive. And I guess there's some common threads and themes we're running on here. So don't feel like you have to repeat yourselves, but um, yeah, if you can reflect on language and then how our comms can truly capture the diversity. Anouk. Oh, thanks, Kate. I think this, um, the thing about language kind of relates to what the previous speakers have said, um, Pradeep and, and Arju. Um, about let's not focus on vulnerability, but let's focus on rights holders. Um, this is particularly important in the Pacific where, you know, most fishes do have some uh, rights over their coastal areas. Um, and I think, you know, we, we look in sort of these frames of maybe deficiency and that can be a problem um, in how the issues are communicated and also how governments perceive those small scale fishery communities. Um, so I think that's my, the language of, of sort of shifting it more to the Indigenous rights language, I think is helpful um, with small scale fisheries, particularly in contexts like the Pacific. Um, to give you an example of that, and this is uh, from my pre-fisheries life, I did a book on um, community resilience in natural disasters. And we looked at um, images from countries around the world that are printed in newspapers after natural disasters. And it's commonly like one lonely woman, you know, with a backdrop of, a backdrop of destruction. Um, you know, these are the kind of images that we promote in the media every day. But actually, if you've ever been in a natural disaster, it's mostly like people actually banding together to do joint action. So the image we put on the cover of the book was um, some people in Pakistan building a levee from one side of the you know, um, uh, flooded river to the other. So these are the kind of the images, I think, as well as the language we use around small scale fisheries is really important to shift it from yeah, something of being deficient to something that is actually resilient um, and people who have rights. Yeah, I think the language question, you know, is, uh, you know, uh, in addition to what, uh, you know, uh, was already been said. Um, I mean, the language should be uh, uh, presented in a way uh, that it is not restrictive or prescriptive, you know, rather it is open and uh, inclusive, you know, um, and that, that's the crux of the thing in itself, you know. Uh, so language should not be controlled, language should not be dictated by, you know, any particular, uh, you know, group of people, including, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, language is prescribed by policy, for example, you know, so, so we know, need more uh, non-prescriptive language, non and more inclusive language. Uh, how can we ensure small-scale fisheries communication reflect diversity? Uh, I talk, uh, talked about, uh, you know, diversity in, uh, as a response to the first question. Um, but in, in, in order to do that, we, you know, how can uh, anyone, uh, you know, ensure that small scale fisheries communities are part of the communication process itself. Uh, and that can range from the uh, conceptualization uh, and, uh, and design uh, to implementation and outcomes, uh, uh, you know, uh, of the communication process itself, you know, it's not like, you know, the small scale fisheries are good enough to be involved in at certain level of the communication process and not other levels. So it has to be at, across all the all the uh, levels um, uh, in the range of uh, in the process uh, that uh, around communication. Um, you know, uh, we you know also need to, you know, uh, see that it is ensured uh, communication happens happens in, in um, uh, at multiple times it's not like you know one piece of communication and then it's over you know so communication is uh, continuous communication is uh, you know uh, you know happening across multiple times and are uh, you know uh, you know messages are conveyed uh, by multiple uh, people 
you know, so, you know, not just by one particular actor or something. Uh, if we do that, then it brings in the multiple perspectives and different uh, people kind of, you know, represent uh, the different aspects of uh, the small scale fisheries diversity itself, you know, so that's a key kind of, you know, um, you know, element in terms of, you know, how to make uh, uh, diversity uh, as part of the communication itself, you know. Uh, but it also depends on what is being communicated, you know, so uh, maybe there are different ways to uh, engage in different types of communication. If it is a communication pertaining to something urgent, like a new policy that has come up and uh, like the 65 days ban that is just, uh, you know, when it was announced, there was an urgency to engage in a communication process. That communication will process will be very different from a, uh, you know, um, uh, Another kind of situation, you know, I don't have an example right away, uh, but it, it depends on the type of uh, situation as well, uh, and, uh, and also what is being communicated uh, by whom, and uh, then that depends on you know, how it needs to be done, uh, who is going to communicate, uh, and what is the timing, and all of those things. Uh, so, you know, in a simplified language, we need the help of these, you know, four or five Ws and the H in terms of asking the communication and diversity kind of, you know, question and responding. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I was having problem with unmuting myself. And I think uh, on local level, you know, uh, uh, it, it is probably the challenge for uh, every nation, so every communities. Uh, uh, people or organizations who have more resources and power, uh, you know, to uh, send out communications material out there, uh, tend to stick with the standard, you know, dialect or a standard form of any language. And uh, it's a barrier for many of the fishing communities, not for all, but many, uh, because, uh, you know, like traditionally, at least uh, in many parts of Asia uh, during colonial period, there were huge changes uh, in languages, like what are the standard form or dialect of languages that is used by nationally, like for example, official communications and so on, government communication. And the kind of language, it's not, you know, just the word, it's not just, uh, uh, you know, being correct uh, about uh, sensitive issues like gender, inclusivity, and so on, but the whole language. For example, uh, if in Bangladesh, I go to in northern area, northeast area in Silet, and I talk uh, like, you know, in a standard dialect of Bangla language, they will not understand. And other way around, if I am there to, you know, document for example, fishers' ecological knowledge, and I try to, you know, document and translate uh, knowledge in the standard format of Bangla to distribute, you know, or to facilitate intergenerational learning within those communities. Then it's lost already uh, because, uh, you know, it, it's difficult, uh, you know, to interpret to translate uh, within. Uh, these even same language, if you have significant cultural difference, right? Just if we are talking about cultural difference. So we can talk about so many aspects of using this kind of, uh, you know, uh, use of language uh, as a tool of access, but at the same time, if we don't do it right, language is also a barrier. The second and last thing I will say about this is, we have so many good tools uh, that, are produced you know, globally, internationally, like for example, the SSF guidelines and so on. And th there is of course a certain uh, you know, needs, uh, these guidelines, these messages are understood or at least you know, communicated within fisheries organizations on local level of fisheries. But again, uh, the way translation works, uh, uh, it's needed and also many things is lost. But if uh, we do it, for example, uh, like in a standard dialect or format of any language in South Asia, for example, then it's like, you know, uh, it's not um, 
95% understandable by the actual people who, uh, you know, uh, was supposed to benefit these communities. And it happens again, the uh, first issue that I raised, one uh, is being, uh, you know, uh, Ever that as an organization, organizations like us, CSOs, big international NGOs, we are not informed about the unknown surprises and very peculiar exclusive challenges in fishing communities. And the language, the diversity of language used by fishing communities, other than you know, the centralized formal format of language in a given nation, is also this kind of similar challenge. So I think uh, I will end with this that. When we are using language to distribute or to doc distribute communication materials addressed to fishing communities, or we are documenting the problems or the challenges they have in their communities, uh, we, we, we need to, of course, you know, focus on how they want it, in what languages, what dialects, what formats, rather than sticking to the formal official version of a certain language. Thank you. There's no easy answer for that one. I think it's, like you said, just tapping into and connecting and building trust with the communities and understanding from them what, what their needs are and what they value. Okay, well, we haven't got any questions from the audience yet, and we do only have five minutes left. Um, I still have a few questions, but instead, I think I'll just throw to the panellists for one final brief reflection. Um, if you've got any final thoughts on, you know, other ways we can either capture and share knowledge or good practices for photos and visuals, enhancing access, or just ways that we can support the small scale fishery movement um maybe you'd each just like to share some brief final thoughts um to leave with all our audience members Anouk? thanks kate and thanks everyone for a great discussion this afternoon um i think the power of language that was that was talked about by ardu is um particularly important to keep in mind and Related to that is technology. Uh, so even things like participating on this Zoom call would be inaccessible for most small scale fishers in Solomon Islands. Um, and we often, you know, have expectations, you know, to participate in different things that the technology that we have and the internet connections we have right now just won't actually um, keep up to pace. So there is a need for um, adaptability and, and actually taking on local needs um, in how we communicate, um, as well as the language issue, which is really important. I'm glad that was raised. Um, I think too, it, uh, there's a need for proper representation of people like one bad practice that I forgot to mention earlier that I really hate is when um, NGOs or something they do a communications material, and they uh, say, you know, uh, Mary, and Mary never has a last name, you know, uh, ethnicity, uh, sort of, you know, her, her whole life is just sort of into this very simple identity that, you know, an uh, international NGO will give to Mary, for example. So I think how we represent, whereas if you actually met Mary, you know, Mary would be in a much broader context of social and cultural norms. So I think the way we represent individuals is really important, as well as what we've talked about already, um, how we represent communities and small scale fishes more broadly. Um, I think in two in relation to good practice, like one of the things that you know we try to do and we don't always succeed is um, to have research outputs in you know an academic form or a sort of policy oriented form um, and then a community form which might be a film or you know something totally different a different way of communicating that fits um, with that local community um, and that's so I think that too you know the, the format of how we do communications needs to be adapted to um, where communities and small scale fishes are at thanks Sorry, now I have a problem of you know unmuting myself. You know, <laughs> uh, I, I think you know there was a lot of good discussion that took place, and thanks to all everyone here. And, um, uh, and I think you know in terms of final thought, you know, uh, somewhat similar to you know uh, what uh, Anuki was saying, is uh, I mean, good communication depends on good uh, material for communication, and uh, in my understanding. 
uh, there is no shortcut uh, to generate this material. There is no uh, quick fix to that. You know, so I'm looking at uh, uh, you know how we engage in the information, the knowledge, and uh, you know other material that can be communicated um, uh, around small scale fisheries. Uh, really, is a long term process, and uh, um, the moment we, we rush, uh, we uh, you know uh, you know kind of you know, disrupt that process itself, you know. So it's a very calculated kind of, you know, pathway and that we need to work, you know, I mean, we means, you know, the communities and everybody interested. Sometimes we kind of, you know, do the rapid action and then uh, uh, get uh, quick uh, messages out, which uh, become counterproductive uh, in the real world. Uh, that includes reaction to certain needs and opportunities and issues at the community level. Also, the way we come in, uh, you know, react to certain developments in the policy uh, arena as well. You know, so so communication, uh, you know, becomes really really long term and has to be seen in that way uh, in order to be effective uh, itself. Uh, the second thought that I have is communication needs to be also uh, thought in terms of an interlinked uh, you know, uh, you know, element, you know, so it's not like communicating on livelihoods, communicating on rights, communicating on, you know, you know other aspect, but how are those uh, different elements or aspects of small scale fisheries interlinked also defines uh, a more, uh, you know, comprehensive and interlinked and connected uh, communication process. You know, it's not like, you know, you, you know, you go very compartmentalized way. So that's the other thought I, uh, I have. Um, and then uh, really the third element is, uh, you know, um, you know, it's a, you know, I said it is a continuous process, but at the same time, you know, uh, who is watching this process, you know, uh, um, you know, of course, you know, there is a lot of us who are doing it, you know, but are we the right, right people? You know, so uh, we can be good partners, but are we the right people to be watching it, monitoring it and seeing when is uh, a certain type of communication or material uh, necessary in what context and how that should be done rather than building that uh, kind of uh, uh, capacity uh, at the uh, at certain levels, and definitely the level I'm hinting at is the is the community level. It's a lot of work. Uh, it's a different approach altogether. But just you know, uh, saying that community based, community engaged research, participatory research, uh, or communication processes would not ma you know mean anything unless we really really do it uh, and and facilitate that kind of a process. The last uh, thought is um, and not least <laughs> is that how can we see or look at communication as a decentralized uh, kind of you know, process? Again, it speaks to the other elements or other points that I've already spoken to um, is, you know, uh, you know, at what level communication becomes really effective. And therefore, uh, you know, we need to look at it at more in a decentralized uh, way and then speaks to some of the points that Anuk was mentioning about, you know, who is engaging in doing this and, you know, you know is it, uh, you know, What's the platform that are being used, and uh, you know the language and everything else you know that we have spoken about. You know, a more decentralized uh, uh, um, uh, process of communication is something that is a challenge, but we should take up that challenge, uh, you know, uh, uh, in a in a positive way. Thank you. Yeah, very quickly and very informally, we are a small group here, so I can be informal. Uh, I, I just say you know, two things. One, uh, let us start to, uh, you know, preach this message that artisanal fishing communities, uh, community fisheries, people in the fisheries are not a mere stakeholder. They are the right holders. So, you know, if we don't conflate between two, it makes a great change of, how, you know, in how we communicate. And lastly, Let's acknowledge, you know, uh, that there are an abundance of unethical, non-inclusive communications in the small scale fisheries. And yeah, you know, uh, let, I would just say, let's talk it about uh, as much as we can. Otherwise, you know, there's no way out. Acknowledge that there is abundance of unethical and non-inclusive communications. And let's talk among us, different kinds of organizations, people and the stakeholders. I think uh, there's no right answer. All you can do is to you know, try to find out how to do better. Thank you. That's the perfect ending point, Arju, because there has been a series of, of webinars and discussions recently on, on this topic. And it is, it's all about creating the space just to have the conversation 
um, and reflect on our own practices, be critical of ourselves and our organisations um, with the intention that we can all learn from each other and support each other. So um, thanks to each of you. I know we're over by two minutes, but thanks everyone for joining. We didn't get quite a big crowd as I had anticipated, um, but still great to hear from you all. And like I said, the recording will be shared. There'll be um, key takeaway messages shared more widely. So. Um, there's a lot of great stuff that's come out of this. So again, thanks everyone and all the best. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. All right. Thank bye you. all. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.